Are we good to go on sound? Great. So I'm Kalila Harris. I am a third year student at, here at Penn in the Penn GSC Mid Career Doctrine and Leadership Program. Uh, we are uh, here with my brother Jose Wilson, educator, um, activist, warrior on behalf of children, my brother in the struggle. Um, we are in our second installment of the Educators on the Square series, and we're here live with a room full of people. We are also live via Google Hangout um, at the Mid-Career website, and we are using the Pen Ed Chat hashtag as a back channel for discussion. Uh, throughout this discussion, we'll be taking questions from people in the room. We'll be taking questions from folk watching live through the live stream, and we'll be pulling questions from folk uh, using Twitter on the Pen Ed Chat hashtag. So first, I want to reintroduce Jose Wilson. He's an educator in New York City schools. He is the author of one of my favorite reading tools right now. If you don't have it, get it. Uh, this is not a test. And he is also a blogger on thejosevilson.com, which is an amazing uh, blog that has had its one millionth hit in the past week. Yeah. A million. Amazing. Right. Six million ways to die, so you need five more million hits, right? <laughs> right, because you're slaying them, right? That's right. <laughs> so the way this is going to work today, we are going to hear from Jose a little bit. He's going to read from his book. I'm going to have him share with us some of his favorite passages. I may ask him about some, but this is really going to be a discussion. Uh, Jose and I actually met virtually through Twitter, at least the first time we met. Um, and, you know, here at Mid-Career, we are doing a lot of active work through the Innovations Lab and with support from Joe Mazza on being connected educators um, and making sure we grow our professional learning networks through using tools like Twitter. And so we hope that this virtual conversation um, in, in companion with the physical conversation allows for people across the country and across the globe to engage in discussions about race, equity, and education reform here in the United States. All right, so I'm gonna hold this mic here because there's one between the two of us. So um, we can also use our teacher voices. So if for any reason uh, you can't hear us, uh, that's because you're not listening. All right, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right, so first up, let's talk about rotten apples, right? Everybody see the Times cover? Yes. Yes. And here we go. And here we go. And scene. So, Jose, you did a blog about uh, the Times cover, and you've had uh, actually a couple of postings on your blog site in addition to exchanges on Twitter um, with people who uh, are opposed to the cover, uh, are incredulous about the cover, um, are indifferent to the cover because the article itself is not as um, harsh as the cover itself. What are your thoughts? What would you like to share with people about that cover and where our dialogue should be going in light of it? This morning, I read um, an article about a Milwaukee school teacher who had cut off a young lady's natural hair because it wasn't appealing to her. Um, just in the last month, you, you hear stories of teachers who um, get in the classroom, tell a kid, um, if I had only 10 days to live, I would kill all the black people that I see. Um, th those are the stories that unfortunately, even though they may be few, they are potent enough for me to believe that we need to have a better conversation, more nuanced conversation about what it means to reform education as a whole. Um, it also unfortunately gives an avenue to people who don't want everyone to have um, the same education to come in and try to so when I think about um, the Time Magazine cover, it's often like, oh, well, we have one side here who thinks it's awful and one side here who thinks, oh, it's, uh, it's just, you gotta hit them between the eyes and you gotta pay all the great teachers and uh, fire all the bad teachers as if that's gonna help the dialogue at all uh, versus having a, a better conversation about what it means to be a good teacher, what it means to be a bad teacher, and then where are these quote unquote bad teachers uh, where are they? And then 
are our current systems addressing those situations? And it, it, it's what I often find too when I start getting into that is like, okay, well, you're black, so you got to talk about race, right? Um, yes. And so, <laughs> and if I'm going to do it though, then you got to come meet me where I am. So on the one end, um, please understand that as our uh, populations are growing in terms of uh, color, so we have uh, more non-white students than white students enrolled in our current public education system, we have to start thinking about ways in which we can integrate uh, true diversity measures into our teacher evaluation. It's not enough to just look at test scores. It's not just enough to look at principal evaluations. We also need to start thinking about all those relationships that are happening within the school and who are we teaching and how are we teaching them about the world that's in front of them. Because even if you're a white teacher in a predominantly white school, what exact, what messages are you sending to the people that are in front of you? Uh, are you telling them that it's okay for certain things to go down when it's in front of them because it doesn't affect them? Or are we creating a more nurturing uh, country, one that will, will um, inevitably t have those rough conversations that be okay with discomfort in the name of progress? And that's something that I'm always wondering about. So that end, I'm neither of these two with whatever have you. So I'm not on either side. Like there are many sides to all these ever formed discussions. And I happen to be on one that would love to have a better discussion around what it means to be a good teacher and what it means to be a bad teacher in light of whatever's happening at the moment. So of course it's good to have a, a time cover that a time cover that can do this sort of thing so we can have that conversation. But then uh, people want to have it in terms of, oh well, um, this is good because and nothing else. This is bad because versus saying, well, let's talk about what this means. How complex is it to really do what we do on a daily basis? Uh, not just teachers, but also educators as a whole, parents being able to make those decisions for their children, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there's that legacy, long standing legacy of uh, distrust of our public school system, unfortunately. And it, that that's it's heavier across racial lines too. I mean, there is that sort of feel that, you know, public education doesn't address my child, and so they gotta leave. I mean, I just watched uh, Nas's Time is Illmatic documentary, and he said, you know, he loved his teachers, but then by the time he got to ninth grade, some of the teachers said, you, we don't want him in here because this school is no good. This school mm -hmm. will not address his potential. Uh, he can express his feelings very well. And you're like, wait, this is Nas, right? right. Nas is, a, he's a amazing, Ilmatic. brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant mind, but the public school system did not address his needs uh, not just intellectually, but also racially, and you know all this other stuff. He he's become a multi-millionaire artist. He's done a lot of great things, and he's done it through a venue that he only knew how to you know go through. And could our public school system sustain his intellect? Not so much. So maybe we need to have that discussion as well. What do our systems look like, and how do they support our um, our kids? And are our teachers prepared? Are they racially, um, I guess, in tune to what's happening in their communities? And can they address and help people form their own paths towards their own ways of life? So you mentioned uh, white teachers who teach in predominantly white schools, and I'd also add maybe um, that the children attending the school might have a certain level of privilege. Can you be that white teacher in a predominantly white school with students who are from privileged families and backgrounds and be a good teacher and not have a sense of cultural competency and awareness? Whew. Okay, so um, that's the thing too. So if you're a white teacher who comes from a privileged background, I think it's almost like you must feel like you have to get in there and talk and, and examine your own racial privilege, examine the ways in which you work, not as a means of guilt, because oftentimes when I hear guilt, it also becomes self-defense and, oh, this is personal and I got to walk away from this. Because the other thing too is if you don't talk about racism, if you don't talk about sexism, if you don't talk about all these other isms, then you are making a political decision even when you think you're being apolitical. Um, so if that's the case, then perhaps it's better for you to jump into these racial discussions and gender discussions and all these other discussions because it's gonna help you become a better person and develop better relationships with the students who are in front of you. Uh, and that's the only way we're gonna push this conversation further is if more people, especially those who have um, the, the most power in these relationships to be able to form them in a much better way. Um, it can't always, the onus can't always be on Kalila. It can't always be on me. It can't always be on uh, those of you who are of color. It has to be on everyone 
who wants to be a part of this. And this is going to be slow, sure, but it's going to be systemic. And once that becomes systemic, then it becomes a better conversation that we can all have, even if you're, you know, at a very privileged school um, somewhere out, you know, in, in the suburbs somewhere. It, we need all or that. even that independent school, you know. It's just like you said, children need to hear and explore diversity and inclusivity. Um, diversity is kind of like a catchphrase these days, you know. Right. We have a diversity director, and we have someone said, uh, one of my classmates said, uh, he's the head of an independent school on Long Island. He said, true diversity comes from cultures that have inclusivity. That will cultivate diversity because we're all diverse. Diversity is not everyone other than white people. White people are also a part of diversity. And when we create inclusive environments, um, that allows us to have true diversity. Right. So the mid-career program is uh, populated by about 75 uh, educators who have on average 15 to 17 years in experience. So most of them are school leaders or district leaders. Um, you also wrote on your blog about bad principals, not just bad teachers, and how sometimes people want you to stake a flag in saying, you know, the reason why education is not good is not because of the teachers, it's because principals don't have leadership. Principals don't support us in this way or that way. What are your thoughts on that for folk here? It goes back to that nuanced conversation. What does it mean to be a bad principal? And could you be a bad principal at an extremely good school? Yes. Could you be a, a really great person who has a lot of leadership but is in a terrible situation? Absolutely. Right. So maybe that person would be looked at as a bad principal because their school is in shambles. Whereas if they're trying to come in and trying to push people and it, it's a little more difficult, then that's something else. I, I often look for characteristics in my principles to be, uh, number one, uh, being able to be courageous um, is a really big thing. And I don't mean just being a lion and you know just yelling at people and all the other nonsense. I actually mean getting in there and saying, okay, these are the things that we can do to better our school. Are you with me? And having that level of commitment from people, trying to seek it out, even from people who you say, oh, well, they've been in the school system for 25 years. What stake do they have? Like, what does this teacher have to do? Like, they're just going to teach however they want anyway. That The principal needs to jump in there, find a way, because our schools and our kids are asking for principals to actually know the names of the kids. Um, I, I'm, I, I often find that principals who don't um, know the names of the students, who often place their own visions of what the kids should be, rather than trying to find out who they are as children and then work from the kids and get that power from them. I think when I see that relationship as not good, then I know that that school's probably not gonna be a positive environment for any child. I mean, I always think about my own, I have a, I have a two-year-old now. Like, why would I want my child in a school where the principal only thinks about themselves and is trying to advertise only what they do and not everything else that's happening in the school and and talk about the positive things that are happening and the things that may not be working, but they're working on that non-working piece. So these are things that, again, that's a nuanced thing. And you got to have, I wouldn't even say the right person, because I think you can be trained in that. Mm -hmm. But people have to be explicit about the sorts of things they're looking for. I mean, do you want just a manager or do you want a teacher of teachers? Right. And maybe that's something for you to think about, like being an instructional leader, being somebody who says, this is the sort of pedagogy we need for our students, and we gotta we gotta do better than where we are now. Even if you think you have the best school ever, like there is that next level is always trying to get better. Um, that's kind of what I look for for principal. Awesome. So I want to remind everybody, uh, Jose's Twitter handle is at the JLV. My Twitter handle is at Ed2BFree, and you can use the back channel hashtag Pen Ed Chat. Uh, and so we'll be taking questions. And again, I also invite the audience, we have a packed house here now um, to ask questions when you are so inclined. But at this point, I'm gonna ask Jose to uh, pick one of his favorite passages. Um, this is not a test, um, shameless plug, and um, share with us and then we'll go from there. By the way, I think it's endemic for me. I need to say the following, whenever you, um, become so vulnerable and you're able to share more about yourself and be critical about the questions that you ask of yourself, then critiques of others become that much easier because you're all, everybody's saying, we all got skin in the game. So with that, I, when you hear this, I'm hoping you think this guy has skin in the game. 
like he really cares about what's going on and it stems from this classroom experience um god got jokes of course if you have a book page 129 if you don't um you'll look for that when you get the book god got um, jokes god got jokes son my first real classroom activity with eighth graders was a complete failure it was like stepping on your shoelaces while walking having your knees buckle under you and letting your face fall flat on a huge green pie with a live studio audience waiting for you to say did i do that idealist as i am when i first strutted into the classroom i thought i'd pick up a piece of chalk and automatically get the respect necessary to make the remaining 179 days left in the school year smooth sailing. I chose an activity that I was certain would make these garrulous eighth graders see themselves as mathematicians and scientists in no time. After all, they were classified as alpha students, as in high achievers. In retrospect, I should have stuck with Gary Rubenstein's reluctant disciplinarian. I kept it simple and plain. This transformative teaching was much harder than I originally thought. I'm still wiping cream off my face. The activity involved dividing the students into groups and giving each group a piece of chart paper. I then asked them to write down occupations in which math was absolutely necessary. When it came time to share what they came up with, almost every group responded with something that involved drugs, a synchronicity that cracked them up, but that bothered me deeply. Don't you all have high expectations? I asked them. Aren't you all supposed to be alpha students? Azam, the class clown, said, yeah, but just because we're alpha students doesn't mean we're smart. No, but he's definitely a smart ass, smart ass. I wanted to respond just like that, but I had to let it go and wallow in the cream pie sticking to my goatee. I realized I was going to have to reveal more of my personality, the one that had made it through decades of being surrounded by wannabe drug dealers and kleptomaniacs. I'd simply have to inject a little more sarcasm into my classroom persona. Then they would bow down to my humor and linguistic powers, and I would conquer them all. First, I tried on my seventh graders. Sometime around December, we were studying geometric figures when a young gentleman, a seventh grade class clown, said to me, Mr. Wilson, I bet I can make you laugh. Okay. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine, get it? <laughs> Mild chuckles followed, but not for me. If there was ever a time to get the class clown, it was here. Michael, that joke is older than World War II. That was whack. Just like that, my mask had come undone. The whole class cracked up. It was uproarious. Michael laughed along, but he also looked a bit like a walking stop sign. I felt bad for a second, but after that, I had his respect as well as that of the rest of the class. Now they think twice before coming into my classroom with weak jokes. Ain't no half step. The moment to get even with Azam came a month later when we were getting into the meat of eighth grade tra of eighth grade math transformations. By that point, I had called every one of my eighth graders' parents at least twice, and I hadn't cracked so much as a half smile. As a young black Latino male teacher, I often get the question, so are you married? Naturally, I would say, yes. And they say, to whom? Her name is Math, I'd replied. Now get back to work. <laughs> they either laughed or rolled their eyes at their corny math teacher. But on this day, Azan decided he'd test me further. Since his crack about alpha students, he had consistently annoyed the heck out of me every chance he got. Even when he was doing well in class, I often had to call his out for some knuckleheaded thing he had done or not done. On this day, he came to me and said, Mr. Wilson, guess what? Yes, yeah, Azan. I was doing your wife last night. She was really good. The rest <laughs> of the class laughed and stared at me, awaiting my reaction. I furled my lower lip nodding my head while everyone got their giggles in. Then I said, funny you should say that because I talked to my wife last night and she said you didn't do her very well. <laughs> oh, oh, yelled the class. The crowd went wild. I couldn't help but add, that's why she came back to me. More giggles. Azam just hung his head and went back to work thinking of a comeback at his desk. I probably went overboard and I only slightly regret it. Actually, I don't but I'll say that I do, just so people don't think I'm any less of an educator. After that, Azam and I exchanged funny barbs for the rest of the year. The more ridiculous we became, the more I looked at him less as, as a student and more as a son. Thank you. Great. Hey, yes. All right, so we're gonna uh, make things a little more lively now. And again, feel free to ask questions. So I wanna talk to you about some of the folk in the education <laughs> atmosphere who uh, 
would suggest that the way for particularly uh, young black students, but students of color to do well is, is if they would just pull up their pants. If pull up your pants, boy, and you're gonna be successful. What's the deal with these folk who are issuing respectability politics as the pathway to a successful career? Steve Perry cannot be the model for how we do things in education. Oh, I said a name, right? Like, oh. <laughs> shots fired. Um, okay. This is not mad shots. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I often find that whenever you look at someone who wants to pull a kid's pants up, you start realizing that the more pants go up, the more money that person gets. And so, um, uh, you know, th there's a sense that when you're trying to build relationships with students and with parents and with teachers, then we need to talk about what those relationships look like. And if your 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 vision is always to blame um, things that have little to do with the actual intellect or the actual potential, then you start focusing on things that are, are very easy to publicize, but really hard to quantify and really hard to suggest. Like, how can how can you judge a, a person who has their pants a little lower than whatever society says and say, my I can measure just how far this person is going to get depending on how low their pants are. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of where we're going with that. And so um, I even think about a person like Bill Cosby, who I, I'm sure you all read, has been um, recently outed as someone who um, is, a, is a hazard to women uh, and uh, is constantly uh, on this respectability politics business. I often wonder how seriously people took his jokes. And then it's like, all right, so then if this is the way that you perceive um, older kids, how do you perceive our young kids? When you have uh, pre-K suspension rates uh, way, way up, and then you look across racial lines, <laughs> they get higher and higher the darker they get. So if you look at uh, black kids who are in pre-K, I mean, I think the, the rate is at 3.3 times mm -hmm. more than the average student, which says a lot about the way we look at four and five-year-olds. So if you look at them at, in that way, then how do we look at them when they start getting older and older? They become less and less innocent, don't they? And they become less and less human. Um, and though, and then you have a rationale for why a, a child should be shot in the middle of the night. You have a rationale. Or the middle of the day. Or the middle of the day. And left his body in the street for four hours. Or the hours. middle of the afternoon. Or mm -hmm. any time, any place for blasting music, for uh, just being themselves. So uh, we have to start looking at our lens and the way we approach humanity for all people. It's one thing to say, you know, this person is a, is black, this person's Latino, this person's Asian, this person's white. And we that that's what we would call just differentiated or even discriminated. But it's quite another to say, because this person is of color, then I must treat them as less human. I must treat them as less worthy of life overall. I must treat them this this way. So that's that's easy to say for people who don't look like that particular child. Sure. But let's check the people who look like the children, right? <laughs> so a lot of times I've heard some outrageous and outlandish things from people of color, you know, saying, you know, um, these kids need a trade. First, it's a pet peeve of mine when people talk about these kids, because I want to know which kids are you referring to, not my children. Um, but they say these kids need a trade. Everybody shouldn't go to college. Everybody shouldn't have to go to college, except they didn't prepare those children. You know, there are plenty of cities, unlike Ferguson, right? So I'm in Baltimore. Um, you have school districts that are led and run by black folk, and children still are not persisting. Expectations are still low for the, those children. Um, what do we do about, or how do we engage people who either are um, indifferent about children who come from families with low incomes, um, or who themselves are putting up barriers in front of children by um, uh, pigeonholing them from a very early age, either through discipline or through the way they them and their families. Because, you know, Steve Perry also said he didn't take a parent seriously because they came in the schoolhouse with SpongeBob SquarePants pajama pants on. And my immediate thought was, they're there, they're at school, clearly they care. Um, but what, how do we break that down with folks I think for one, it's important for us to understand that um, I think people of, I would even say just black people, period, don't often get the chance to say, we are not a monolith. And so 
there are all these uh, varying ranges of political ideology uh, for better or worse, right? Because there are some people who unfortunately will, will never get the opportunity to have the opportunity to say we have, for instance, to express our voices and deconstruct those things. But even so, you think about how Steve Perry got on Mel Melissa Harris Perry show and she validates it by having him on, even though she, she treats him as a foil, but then it becomes, all right, well, so I put you on instead of putting on someone who actually will, will enlighten us, who will give us that nuanced conversation. Uh, if you keep highlighting the same folk and saying, okay, even if I don't agree with, I'm still going to give you voice because you have 40,000 followers, then we're doing a disservice to the sorts of voices that we actually need out there to have a critical conversation about race, about schooling in general. And, um, and so, of course, I do put myself out there as well. I'm like, yes, I, I can be that person. But then if I'm going to be that person, I'm going to carry along 20, 20 people along with me, people who are actually doing this sort of work about deconstructing race in a very positive way um, and schooling as well. Um, I, I think the other portion too is um, we need to have better conversations locally as well, not just nationally, but locally. I think it always starts with that local piece. Like how many friends do y'all have that say, I have a black friend, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> because I, ha I have- I think two is now the quota since I, we're post-racial. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then is, is two enough? Like, are you good with that? Like, and once you have those two, like, are, are you fine? Like, are you done with exploring your circle? Or, because um, I mean, I have white friends. Some of my best friends are white, right? Um, and I guess that works for me. And I'm like, oh, wait, I know everything about white people through the, the best friends that I have who are white. But it's like, no, they, it's almost as if uh, people of color, especially black people, aren't afforded that opportunity to say, hey, listen, I, we have diverse experiences about this. There are some common things about our characteristics. Like there is this whole, uh, I guess, the, the fried chicken bit. I mean, I love fried chicken. I, I, it's not it's not to say that, you know, other people are going to have to love fried chicken, but I just happen to love it. And some of my friends do too. And we just happen to be black and we just happen to like fried chicken. We go to the same spot. But um, it doesn't mean that white people can't love fried chicken too. Which they do, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, From my two friends. <laughs> Apparently, right, and the co the collard greens can can go with a lot of different things, you Absolutely. know. You, you put it down, and that's fine. And, and see, but then then it becomes a conversation of what characteristics do we assign to different people, and do we hold them accountable to that piece? Like, are you going to hold me accountable to fried chicken the next time you see me, or are you going to have a conversation with me about math? Okay, please, I, I would love a conversation about math. But no, you're gonna hold me accountable to a conversation about, oh, you know, I have this, this black kid in my class. Can you take care of him for me? Because I really don't know how to talk to him. No, I don't want to take care of that for you. You have to do it for yourself. You have to find a way to reflect within yourself and then have that conversation with them without relying on folks like Steve Perry, Michelle Reeves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the people who, you know, will not give you a positive mind frame for looking at the students that we serve. So speaking of the students we serve, you tell a story about JJ in your book. Can you read a little bit from there? Jeez. Let me see, let me see. Um, 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 um. Wait, wait, that's it? You know the last chapter? Yeah. Oh, God. I gotta, see, this is what's beautiful about tech. You gotta, you can scroll all the way to the Does anyone have a question while he finds it? Please do. About Thank you kindly. Yeah, sure. And so to some extent, you have to conform to it until you can get to the point whereby your voice can be heard. So as children of color, they have to be aware of that. That if you try to go to, I don't want to say rogue, but if you try to get and want to be, um, uh, to go against that, so you're, you're 
I just want to so, say into the microphone, you are asking about. Um, the whole idea, did I hear you say that they should uh, not, that black people should not be so concerned about the pants pulling down? Am I correct that that's what you are saying? I'm actually more saying that um, we need to be concerned with folk who think that people with their pants a little lower are any less human. I, I think that's really where it's at. Um, there's, see, because I also go by Lisa Delphi, who I, I would suggest everyone read if they haven't already. Um, there is this idea that people need to learn how to code switch within a society because, you know, there is that nation within a nation theory and, there, you know, there's a code in which you live by when you're with your friends and there's a code that you live by when trying to learn what, what general society needs for, in order for you to be successful in the mainstream society. And, um, you know, there, there's, a, I speak to that there's like two different types of thinking of processes behind that. One is which it's important for you to have white teachers, for instance, in your school because they know the code. Like who better to teach the code than the person who, um, who most benefits from that code being active. But then on the other end, you also need uh, teachers of color who can tell you how to decode that code. Uh, so that, that's why you need a diverse staff. But then there's an element that says, okay, if I see you with your pants a little lower, I don't think you're any less human. I just think that we need to go switch the code so you can be successful in what we're doing here. Uh, but then if you go home and do that, by all means, please do, because that is your space, that is your environment. I can't treat you any less human because of that. I can't shoot you down in the middle of the day because of this. So I, if I will jump in here, Otis Lawrence Graham had an article released this past Friday where he talked about how he taught his children to be quite respectable. He and his wife were both undergrads, grad school, law school, Ivy League, and they live in a wealthy enclave and they send their kids to the best private schools. They dress them in preppy gear, close haircut, and that didn't prevent his child from being called a nigger when he was away at camp um, um, at an independent school for the summer, that his 15-year-old then was forced to suppress his feelings about being called a nigger by two grown men on the street um, because he didn't want to appear too racial. Mm -hmm. And so his child having his pants pulled up did not protect him from society, the one in which he lived. And Otis Lawrence Graham talked about how as a family, they did not, they falsely prepared their children to think that conforming to standards of whiteness equaling rightness um, would protect them from what the real world is about. Um, so I would push and say, I would say that telling a child that the way for them to be successful at some point is to conform is a part of the problem. That therein, therein lies respectability politics. You, you need to have respect for yourself according to whom, I'm not sure, um, in order for us to value your voice when their voice should be valued the moment they walk in the building, pants sagging or not. So, and uh, shoes, but we know that it's wrong. Right, but there, there, we have to figure out that gray space wherein we disrupt that norm. So it's not only decoding, it's recoding. Mm -hmm. You know, when do we recode? Because if we're just spending time teaching children how to decode, um, we are adopting the assumption that the code is correct and what we all should live live by. So let me get some other questions. Um, I saw. Still in the back, and then Cheryl. This one, I don't think that there's an answer to this one. It's about the community. Um, what was it's bigger, than than as, as a, as a bigger than pants. As a black boy in a predominantly white public school, was when I was one of the top 20 in my class. And we sat down for a meeting to decide what we were going to wear. And it was decided that I would wear a blue blaze blazer and tight pants. And I was like, I don't own that. I'm the only black boy in the room. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming home and saying, Mom, I can't wear my suit because they say I have to have a blue blazer and tacky pants. And my mom's like, well, you can't, you can't afford that. You know, you can't afford that. You have to wear your suit that you have to have. And there was some stigma associated with that. And people were like, you don't have a blue blazer. And even today, when I got my job at the first independent school, it was like tacky pants. And I just had a cringe because I thought back to that moment. Mm -hmm. I thought back to the moment of everyone in the room judging me because as a little black boy, that I love because my dad was a smart dresser that I put on and it's like <laughs> and I, I was like, oh. so it, it's more than about your hands I think once you start to look at um, the 
subtlety behind how we say what's acceptable. Or I remember in the middle school, someone said, "You have to wear a tie because people in our favorite schools are like, like wearing ties." With, with all with all due respect, um, I have a feeling that um, I'm not. I mean, because I was private Catholic school uh, for my four years of high school, it was predominantly white, and I never once um, veered from the uniform policy. But I, I, I feel as if you and I share an experience where it wasn't the color of our blazer that was in effect there. So even even if we had followed all the rules, right. as, as you were mentioning, even if we followed all the rules, we would still have um, a little color issue there. Um, Ava and then Marquita and Cheryl. <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> Out of bankruptcy, represent Detroit. I don't, I don't know if it's, see, because when I look at uh, kids wearing those sorts of styles and them not being actually about that life, it usually means that they too are following a, a code or a uniform that helps them fit into that culture, right? So there's the one where, you know, the school is, enfor is enforcing a uniform. And so in order for them to fit into the school, they have to wear the uniform. There's, there's a reverse where there's an outside influence and they have to fit into that uniform in order to feel like they are part of that. One way that I see that seems to be very effective is when the school or even just even a set of teachers is able to say, okay, this is how we do things here. You belong to us. And by belong, I mean, you are part of our family. And if you're able to get them into a culture that wants them to be in there and they can be a, a student, child in that school, then they too will conform to whatever's happening within that school in a positive way. So for instance, in my classroom, um, I have been very quick to tell kids, you, you know, pull up your pants, take off your hat, and let's get ready for school. Because in school, we have a certain set of norms. But the only way I'm able to do that is if I'm also able to have private conversations with them, like, how are you doing? How's everything going? You know, how's, how are you, how are your family doing? How's, you know, I spoke to your mom recently, those sorts of things. Because I make them feel like they belong right. in my classroom. And so if I'm able to help them do that, and if we have a whole set of teachers who does that as well, then I have a feeling that kids start seeing, oh yeah, miss, um, I need to pull up my pants because this, this or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because this is my environment, and this is a much more safe environment than it is outside when I have to pretend like I'm something else. Mm -hmm. So I, that's kind of 
the battle there. And we can only go so far, obviously, but there's a sense when you go into a school that really cares, the kids do follow along because they see that this is a much more nurturing environment than has been granted to them outside. Repress about JJ, that's a good segue, and I'm gonna get some more questions. Oh, so um, I, I there's two pieces going on here. One is that I talk about JJ, he's the quintessential bad kid, but then I also talk about a co-teacher while at the same time who's uh, fighting cancer. And um, she she's one of the stronger teachers because she's able to uh, pierce through a lot of her own, well, she's a, she was a white Jewish lady, uh, she had passed away uh, at the end of the school year. But within that, I also have the struggle with JJ. And I also think about how she would have felt if that was, if um, she had still been alive and present in that school year. Um, okay, so do you want me to read from the beginning? Nah, I don't feel like it. Thank you. Go in. Okay. Nah, I don't feel like it. Never leave me alone. The day began like any other during my tenure as math coach, I hop into the library first thing in the morning, grab my book cart, whisk it into my assigned room for the day, and started setting up my, as the students walked in. By the time the bell rang at eight o'clock, I was ready with an iPad in hand, taking attendance. The bulk of my students arrived by 8.02, enough time for me to get my objective and do now activity on the smart board that I had turned into a whiteboard because my school laptop takes 20 minutes to load up. Pencil scratch notebooks as I prompted my students to think about the activity, a segue into my lesson for the day. I sighed loudly at the few students who came in at 8.15, but continued the lesson to honor those who had arrived on time. At around 8.25, well into my lesson, JJ, the bad kid, walked into the classroom. I said, good morning. He didn't reciprocate. He sat in the back of the classroom. I asked him to get up and go to his assigned seat. He said no. I prompted him to do it again. He obliged, jogging his feet. Everyone stared. I waved my hands in a circular motion, trying to get the rest of the class back to work. JJ pulled out his binder. I smirked a bit. He started writing something. I smirked a bit more. I walked around to see others working on their assignments. JJ had his head down in his notebook. I looked over his shoulder. He was working on an assignment for a different class. I shook my head in disapproval. JJ, I need you to get back to work on the assignment we had today. No. JJ, I need you to try this. It's not too difficult. I need something from you, anything at all. No. Okay, let's try this again. You, in, you are in my math class. We already spoke about the work you, about the work you need to get done in my class. This is how you succeed in my class. Now, nah, I don't feel like a nigga. Leave me alone. I cocked my head back, surprised at the way he had addressed me. I walked away for a second, then asked him to step out. He took his stuff and made his way to his usual chair in the dean's office. I continued with my lesson, hoping I hadn't come off as too rattled in front of the other students. After class, I peeked inside the dean's office and found JJ gone, perhaps for the rest of the day. I walked into my station in the principal's office and stared at the computer screen. Before that moment, I had written long notes to JJ, hoping he would read them and feel inspired to give himself a shot. Every so often, he actually wanted to be in class. As a bad kid, he walked the hallways when he chose, pushed boys and girls in and out of the classroom, never wore a uniform, told teachers off, and cut out of eighth period. He became well acquainted with the deans and assistant principals. Like so many others who get this label, also served as a foil, an example adults could point to and say, don't be like him. One person who never bought into the bad kid stereotype was Miss Walmart. Do you want to recite? Yeah, go ahead. The, this aggressive, red-haired Jewish woman with her sturdy walk always strolled into a classroom with an exasperated face or an I need a smoke face. They are hard to differentiate. Her shouts shook her classroom wall so much that even the adults didn't venture near her classroom. My first interaction with Ms. Baldwin wasn't at a faculty meeting or in the teacher's lounge. It was about six feet from her classroom, where she almost blew the door off with her bellow. I had heard about her reputation for her classroom management and work ethic in more ways than one, but it was her boundless dedication to the bad kids, the one who had little faith in their own academic ability that made an impression on me. She knew she could shout over them, but that didn't satisfy her. 
She spent plenty of time getting in their faces about work, but also tried to understand them on a personal level. This rabbi's daughter turned bookie and pool shark, who had told stories of dirty pool halls and the miscreants who roamed them, found an unlikely home teaching impoverished black and Latino kids in Washington Heights. Luz and Suleika, my friend, and her social studies counterpart in the, my first year, had brought her under their wings when she arrived. But she had grown into her own time, into her own by the time that I befriended her. She loved telling the story of Jason, a kid who she had stayed in touch with, writing letters and driving up to prison to give them moral support. Jason had had a reputation since the first day he walked into the hall for misbehavior. I never interacted with him personally, but I had heard other teacher stories. Some were happy not to happen, but Miss Wallman would always smile when she recounted Jason and the other knuckleheads and rambunctious kids. She identified with them. Jason was perhaps the first kid who had made her realize this. She had kept mental note of all her bad kids ever since. All right. Marquita? No? Cheryl? There's a balance between individualism and um, time and place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I would just add that it was also helpful to have those conversations in the only place that we have the space to talk about how to do this. Mm -hmm. That's really what popped my being, not the fact that the conversation exists because there is a time and place for everything, but the fact that the conversation never seems to exist when it comes to white kids or how white kids. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, when I went to Syracuse, um, I had been known for, um, I guess, my, my really radical uh, attire, if you will. No. You? <laughs> okay. You believe me. Um, it, and so I had worn my band, I wore a bandana one day to go to the movies. I, I totally forgot I had it on because I had worn it so much. Um, and it wasn't, like, obviously I wasn't affiliated with like a gang or anything. And even if I was, who cares? Like I just had a bandana on. And uh, one of the, the security guards at the mall had said, uh, can you take that off? There's a bandana on your head. Um, right behind me on the escalator as I'm walking up were two uh, younger white kids who had also had a bandana on. And all of my friends had said, guys, look, there's a bandana right there. Go chase them. And of course, the you know, the police officers started running after them like, oh, you got to take the bandana off too. It's like, you weren't even thinking that until you until we said something. So, you know, those are the things that I always talk talk about too. It's like um, when we think about education reform, I always use this line, you know, education, um, we didn't land on <laughs> education reform. <laughs> education reform was landed upon us. Right. And so um, what we have to always think about, you know, what are the racial and I, I guess even gender and even class implications for education reform? Why is it that Whenever we talk about education form, we're not talking about education in the upper 25%, and even the upper 1, 2, 10%. We're talking about always the bottom rung. We, we always take shortcuts for the things that we want to actually get done, but we don't invest enough in, in the folks that need it the most. And of course, there's that intersectionality between race and class that all, often clouds our judgment about what education reform ought to be. Right. Yep. One question about education reform. First, I want to say, as a, a biracial Jesuit grad in Jersey City, and sometimes uh, going to jump at the big buildings, ah, yes. you were dug at. Right? Oh goodness! Chance for justice under God is how Catholic high school people punish you when, when you when your tie is loose or your coat is off or something. Anyway, um, the national dialogue on I don't know if you call it dialogue, the national narrative or the hegemony with uh, reform is is really voiced by folks in business or in educate or entrepreneurs or or maybe even the so-called performers like Dean Shelby types really isn't space for teachers, teacher educators, even school leaders. Um, like there is a teacher voice, so to speak, 
in that dialogue. Now, you're, you're doing your stuff, and your book, you talked about this rally in Washington where folks got together on that, which I wish I knew about. Um, I'm wondering where you see are the, the, the prospects for um, teachers and others to get in the, kind of force them, themselves into the narrative on national narrative, on reform. Uh, and I don't know if it's like to change schools completely or to, to work and change some of the dialogue, but where do you see are some of the possibilities for folks to organize and to be maybe a movement or things to change or, or what folks can do? Great question. How can teachers organize and get their voices amplified in education right. reform? Well, I've taken an unconventional route only because I've, I've also felt like um, there are certain routes that are out there that aren't quite as positive as I would like. So on the one end, you know, 2011, Save Our Schools March had some of the largest names we have in education reform today, progressive voices, you know, from all over, the, all across the spectrum. Um, what, what 2011 did, even though we had a good, like, 5,000 people there, um, it, it spurred a lot of the, the sort of resistance that you start seeing now. So, you know, there's this Tea Party element that's trying to break down the Common Core. I would never follow the Tea Party because they don't see me as human. Uh, sorry. Um, so there's that element. There's also the the, the bats, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had that conversation too where they're called the Badass Teachers Association. Uh, I know I've just used their name. Um, I guess it's important for teachers to be angry at what's happening in education reform when they're constantly getting bashed. But then what do you do with that energy? Mm -hmm. Is it just, I'm just gonna be angry? And are you going to look at the same folk to be that pillar for you and say, oh, look, um, Diet Ravage told me that I could be angry and that's okay. And so she gets in political, she says, you know, people say, oh, she's the beacon for teachers because she's saying stand up for them. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I mean, she, and again, you know, she endorses my book. I'm good with that, but then, what do we do for the next level? You can't, you can't always be like, okay, um, these bad reformers, these are the bad people. Right. And so we need to go after them. You don't have a plan after that. You're done. Like, you can't leave this hole of, you know, something. You got to give, you got to fill it up with something. And so I, I look at folk like Alina Darling Hammond. Mm -hmm. I look at folk like, you know, even Deborah Maya. Max and Billings. And then, and I even look at a local person like Chris Lehman who's actually thinking about these things right. in a progressive way and trying to fill in that gap in one way, shape, or form and thinking beyond the conversation that's now that's saying, oh, we, once we knock down uh, um, Steve Perry and Arnie Duncan and uh, Bill Gates, once we knock them down, everything will be fine. It, it'll all work itself out. But for who? Who's that going to work out for? Oh, right, uh, the people who are most affected by education reform. And so... Um, those are things I think about. And so when I get out there, I'm hoping that I can develop a better conversation around what does it look like to have a, a progressive pedagogy? What does it look like to have um, a better form of teacher evaluation? How can we get more uh, teachers to be racially conscious and then also try to develop a, a stream for um, teachers of color, specifically male teachers of color, who by the way, total, including Asian, Latino, Black, uh, Native American, total male teachers of color, 3% of the entire workforce. Um, and, and of course, that's not to say that we can't, you know, that we can't have white teachers teaching our, our folk, but then we also have to think about, okay, so then if you're not gonna do that, then how are you gonna address our kids? Mm -hmm. how, are you preparing? how are you preparing them? So I always say to other people too, like, I think, you know, the people of color who are in these schools, who, if, if they're the only ones, they ought to get a PD credit for having to be the ones that people always rely on to say, oh, can you take care of this race thing for me? It's like, no, 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 it's okay. Like, let's all take care of it because then if you only put it on one person, then nobody learns. Right. Nobody. It right. doesn't help any one person. I mean, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, having discussion and reflection on race cannot be a singular PD, right? So for all the folk in the room who are school leaders, if you think that you're gonna have that PD on race and that your school is being progressive about how to engage its children, or if you think you're gonna have that PD on diversity, you probably are not a very strong school leader because that can't possibly be the way that we advance this discussion. If it's not one of the priorities of your school, particularly in urban school districts, but also in the most affluent school districts or independent schools, if race, inequity, um, and justice are not a part of your platform on how instruction is um, evaluated, is engaged in, 
um, is communicated, then you are a part of the problem, right? Tony? So the question is about the uh, voice of students themselves in education reform from Tony Sananis. Thank you. Let me tap the person to my right and say just how wonderful a, a panel I went to last month. Um, it was hosted by the White House Initiative for African American. Um, so I, I, I forgot the rest of it, but I just because I, I think about White the House Twitter initiative, hashtag. White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Uh, hashtag AFAM EdCheck. That. And Has, so, hashtag AFAM Ed Summit. Hashtag Go I'll ahead. get it together soon. All right, um, all right. <laughs> and so I, I think about that summit, and I'm like, wait a minute. If all you had was student panelists, none of whom were prepared to talk, none of them who were chosen per se but they all had something to contribute and they just let their voices out. I think oftentimes we need to start thinking about the ways in which we engage our young people and not to say, oh, look, um, I'm gonna teach you how to talk and, be, and instead say, oh, let's just talk. Let's just go out there and let's see what your ideas are and then build from there. I think that we suffer from a severe case as uh, Sheehan Barrett always says, uh, a, a severe case of adultism. We always want to, uh, push our adult visions of what they are. I mean, I've had countless principals tell me, hey, um, I think we should have middle values for our kids. We should instill as if middle class values are uh, the best values to have for all kids. Uh, whereas, why don't we see what values they have and what, what do they bring to the table? Are they family oriented? Do they love their community too? Do they have ways in which they care for each other? Do they bond? And if so, how do they bond? How is that related to folks? So those are things that I always think about too. And then how do you let your kids actually talk it out? I mean, yes, as a teacher, there are times when I find things a little inappropriate and I have to start guiding them in different ways. But I've often found that if I have private conversations with kids, the first thing I say is, what's going on? And I just stay quiet, I keep my mouth shut for a good couple minutes and I just let them express themselves. And I think once you start seeing those expressions and ways in which kids actually are able to connect and are so more, much more in tune than adults are about what's happening in your school, Absolutely. it's powerful. I always would have, um, I like the let out, I like the let out from the club, which is after the club when people are doing their walk of shame home. I like the let out from school when I was a school leader. And at the let out, that was a time where any kids would just come into my office and say, Miss Harris, let me tell you what's about to happen on the bus on the way home. Miss Harris, did you see that Facebook post that such and such said? Miss Harris, you need to get your teachers in check because this teacher was not prepared for class and I wasn't having it. And so young people always know what's going on in their worlds. And that summit that you referred to, Dr. Sean Harper here at the Center for the Study of Race, um, Inequity in Education, and David Johns, who's the Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Hashtag Teach the Babies. Hashtag Teach the Babies. Shout out to David Johns. They, you know, we've been doing these summits across the country, and for this last summit, they decided it was important to have young people only on the panels. And the reason we did that was because all of the other summits made clear, we already know what the issues are, right? So when you go to these conferences, when you go to, uh, South by Southwest EDU or um, an ed camp or whatever the case may be, you have panels filled with adults and there's no young people on the panel. And that seems um, ridiculous and backwards. So instead we decided to have a panel, excuse me, a summit where all panels were completely populated by youth and young people. And it was uh, um, moving for me to be one of the facilitators because of course the young people knew exactly what they needed from us and we just needed to listen so and there were more than there was more than one tear in that room shed yeah absolutely Tears. yes yep. yep go ahead no to the conversation about race i think one that we've been struggling with i feel like over the years is our cohort and then especially people of color beyond the context of What role do you see the community playing in that conversation? Um, I think a lot of families are thinking of you know, our kids and, and how they become a 
part of that conversation or if they can be two. Um, so sometimes I worry that we might be having this conversation in isolation. It's kind of like that that moment where we're like we're not really hearing what the needs may be or what the perceptions may be. And so uh, I don't know. So just something I'm thinking about in terms of community <coughs> engagement and volunteers to reform and make change. That's that sounds like to me like and you know the thing is I, I would love to get into conversations where there are no protocols, but unfortunately we need a sort of protocol because unfortunately what happens is people start getting into their like-minded groups. So for instance, um, you'll have a, a chat somewhere and you know you start thinking about, okay, look at this chat and look at all the people who get to be part of this chat. And it always ends up being like the same folk. And then- um, Or predominantly white. Yes, mm -hmm. that, and actually that's both, <laughs> right? And so um, do we invite specific people to come join in and then you do you start seeing a, a, a shift in the conversation once you bring those folks in so uh for instance even in my own school there was there was a conversation being had about some new initiatives that was going to happen and i had prompted them to bring one student that i knew had something really valuable to put in but when she came in not all of the adults were ready for it and so they kind of um again use their adultism to insist that there was nothing wrong with the school and they have no idea what they're talking about and even though this is one of the, most, the more intelligent students in our school it's always like oh it's about me instead of it's about us and then like i always think well if you can have those conversations within the school and develop a protocol for how you have it in the school then it's it, it'll be really good once you start bringing other folks in because you are you're already starting to reflect you're already having that mind frame and so people who come into your cipher mm -hmm will start saying, oh, look, he's being reflective. She's being reflective about their practice. And so I, I feel this humility. I feel this sense of community from you, and I can build with you from there. And so my, my doctoral research, and you know this, Tony, so Tony's doctoral research is on how leaders are using social media as a part of their growth and development. My doctoral research is about um, uh, how black leadership is engaged in education reform and whether or not we have a seat at the table in light of the fact that our community is most heavily impacted um, not only at the local level, but at the national level. And I think when we have these discussions about how we bring people in, you know, and we can actually pivot at this point in the conversation to talk about these hashtag wars. And just like you said, um, uh, many Twitter chats and other forms of social media where the space is predominantly white and, and replicating what's happening in the general public, even though on Twitter, there's a large number of um, black presence on Twitter, but yet conversations happening about education and edu education reform are primarily populated by white folk. We have Petrelli, who did his article every couple of years on um, Twitter influencers, and he mysteriously left off all the brown people until the brown people were like, I think your list is missing some people. And he gave some lame excuse about, you know, we didn't put teachers on the list. Um, right, hashtag side eye. But, um, you know, it, it, <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about how uh, we all allow ourselves to, um, use our privilege to amplify the voices of other and uh, others and the people who are most readily impacted by what we're trying to do. Um, and of course, this is where I take some credit for that situation because again, like you have uh, Michael Petrelli coming out with a list of all the education influencers on Twitter. And the list just happens to have no people of color save Michelle Rhee. And you're like, okay, there are a couple of us who talk more about policy than you think. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I made a comment and I said, you know, you don't have any people of color on your list. And sure enough, he was like, oh, snap, I, I might, I don't want to come off as racist. So let me put on his suggestions anyway. And then that, that floor us into another discussion about what it means to be an education reformer, what it means to talk about policy. Um, this whole piece about bringing more teachers in, it's like, no, actually, Jose is the teacher. And so I'm going to bring him on and I, this is the way I'm going to save face. And I'm like, I, I can't be your token. I, I will not do this. And so we're, I'm going to give you a list of folk that you could perhaps start looking at and have discussions with. And, um, and so when that started happening, it's like, OK, well, we have a couple of more people on this list. But even then, when you look at the list, you start thinking about who's actually really influential in education reform. And it, it doesn't have to be a, a predominantly white list in order for it to be valid amongst in, in his Absolutely. eyes. And if he's the one judging that, if he's the kingmaker for this, then we need to have that conversation again. Um, but there's a lot of kingmakers as well within the social media spectrum, right? So there are people who say, 
you know, these are the people who, these are the 100 people that aren't Duncan should follow. I've made a list of 100 folks. And again, Tom Wimby is my boy. Like, I, I love this man. But I didn't love him when he came out with that 100 uh, people list and did not at all mention any person of color. And then I told him, wait a minute. Like, he said, oh, I don't know any educators of color. And I said, wait a minute, you've been following me now for the last two years. What is wrong with you? I am a person of color, ostensibly. <laughs> Purportedly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I know, right? You got to do something. And so sure enough, he includes me on the list. Arn Duncan starts following me. I, that's cool. But then I'm like, but then do I want Arn Duncan to follow me or do I want him to do right better by my kids? Mm -hmm. And so I have to use that platform wherever we go. It's not so much that I need to be on some sort of list or I need to get some sort of award. It's like who gets a voice and what sort of voices are amplified. And then can we have more people have these conversations on a thorough level? Absolutely. Uh, we had a, a tweet come in from I am Okima and you know, she mentioned the fact that sometimes she is the only person of color on the chat and she's been well received, but I think it's also important and imperative for people of color not to opt out of the space, right? So um, I have worked with the AFAMED chat, which happens uh, twice per month, and those chats are also predominantly, by, predominantly populated by people of color and black people for the most part. And so there are white faces who come in and engage with us, and they are certainly welcome and not shunned. Um, but it's imperative on us both across the aisle to engage in those spaces. But I wonder about you know people like Rafrance Davis. You can't tell me that um, you don't know any black educators on Twitter, and this sister uh, is actively participating in chats. You you know we have folk like um, Sabrina and you, of course, Andre Perry. You know, you have folk who are doing this work, yet they are somehow invisible. And I wonder about that um, because that also happens in the national education reform landscape, right? The people, there's a fight club of uh, self-proclaimed education reformers. And outside of Michelle Reed, there are no people of color in that fight club. So exactly what are they fighting for and uh, who are they fighting with? Do they want us in a fight with them? The answer is no. Um, but, <laughs> but I also- Tell us how you really feel. I often find, and this is always a strategy that I use, it's like, okay, so if, you know, if you're going to invite me somewhere, you know what's going to happen, right? Uh, and it's always, you know, there's always a sense of danger, but then people invite me anyway, and I'm not sure why, because they know they're going to get the honest truth. I, I'm going to give it to them. I can't give it to them any sort of way. I actually, we planned this so it could be a more honest session. Um, but then if you're in that space, what do you do once you get the mic? I mean, there are times when people say, oh, well, they're never going to pass the mic, so why should I offend it? I got to make my own thing. It's like, you could also just walk in there and say, hey, listen, um, I have something to say, too, and I'm going to go ahead and say that, and I'm going to kick in the door, wave Wait. in the 4-4, four, four. <laughs> um, in the words of the notorious B.I.G. Um, renowned scholar, uh, Denise Smalls. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in any case, I, I always think it's imperative for us to just keep pushing the conversation. And sometimes I, I it is this thing about being polite mm -hmm. and always trying to conform to whatever is happening within that chat. And you got to use the same lingo versus saying, I have something that I think will move this conversation further. And perhaps I may not be as polite as you like, but I know it's because I'm coming from a place of learning, not from a place of hurt. So um, Janet Parlato, who is one of my cohort members here at Mid-Career, she said, do I want Arnie Duncan to follow me on Twitter or do I want him to do right by my kids? That's right. That's a quote from Jose, right? It Absolutely. Do I want him to do right by, by our kids? Let's bring ourselves back to that. We have a lot of people on Twitter who are looking to be edgy celebrities. Tw Twitter celebrities who are more interested in followership than they are really using that platform to amplify issues that are important. What are your thoughts there? How do we break that up? I, I think it'd be, it's one thing if you amass followers because you think you have a great idea and you need as many people to hear you as possible. But unfortunately, what's happening now is people are amassing followers for the sake of amassing followers instead of trying to build something with it. Like what, what are you actually voicing? Are you voicing um, some sort of tech company? And if that's your thing, then I'm happy for you. Um, are you voicing the fact that you're cool and, you know, everybody should know you? I'm happy for you as well. Like, if people want to go drink with you, that's cool, too. I'm Do happy you want to just you. appear like a thoughtful educator? <laughs> and if that's if your if appearance is your motivation, then I won't I won't knock your hustle only because Twitter will allow people to follow me, too. 
will allow people to follow her too. And if we can get more thoughtful folk to be more followed and then have those ideas amplified, even when it's risky, even when it hurts just a little bit to weave, even when um, it, it, it kind of taps at something that was neglected before that person came in, then we do a great justice to ourselves once those conversations come to the fore. And that's what I'm always thinking about. Who's pushing conversation? And what conversations are actually being had? Are they the same conversations that anyone can just Xerox? Or is it something that, yes, that we can move with whatever that idea is? And we that's that's kind of what we're there for, right? right. So not just, and the word disruption has kind of been wa hijacked. watered down. Yeah. Hijacked, watered down, diluted, and all that. I, I think it's more about pushing it to somewhere where we can all grow. We can all learn something Absolutely. more so than about like whatever the latest technology is. Okay, so I'm gonna take two final questions. Just tell me your name. Andy. I'm gonna start with Andy. Hi, I'm working off the Arnie Duncan now follows you thing. So if you could, uh, not in not trying to like completely shoot down race to the top or no child left behind or that standard group stuff and town and stuff. Well, how can you get in there and reframe things for how should he and the and the country like with some nuance take some things from that but get the focus more on kids or get the focus more on learning so that learning doesn't hijack achievement or things like that. Because you have you have a voice now. He's going to listen to you. I'm not saying you're going to change him right away in a 240 <laughs> character tweet. Right. But uh, I'll, what, what should we do? I'll say this. I did have the distinct pleasure, thanks to Twitter um, and um, the White House FM <laughs> initiative. White House initiative on educational excellence for African Americans. We say the whole thing because excellence isn't always equated with African Americans and our children are excellent. It, it's hashtag black excellence. Um, and <laughs> Come on with it. Hashtag wars. I love yes. that, right? So um, I had the privilege of actually getting to meet Arn Duncan. I, I, sat at, um, I sat at the VP at, at the vice president's desk and he just walks in and says, no, no, just stay right there. You're good. I'm like, why is everybody else standing? I don't, I don't get it. I'm just here at the desk. <laughs> so it's kind of a funny moment. Um, more along the lines of what you're asking, I, the two questions I asked him was, um, how do you feel that your initiatives to raise the consciousness of, of men of color working in, in your eyes? And what are you doing to elevate that conversation? And then... There was this thing, there was this big document, I forgot what the name of it was, it's the teacher leadership one where he wanted to pay teachers a significant amount of money more. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked him about that document, like it had gone around, I was one of the people who actually advocated for it because I felt like it was in the right direction, it was going in the right step. And I asked him, so, you know, um, there's been a pin drop about this document, what's going, what's gone on with that? And his answers, of course, were very like down the middle, um, but, I think one thing he said was that this document um, lives in the spirit of all the things that they're doing now, which I'm just like, yes, but can we push that conversation a little further? Can we keep, and those are the ways that I think I can do a justice, not by talking about no child left behind and racism type, which as, I, as far as we can tell, have not worked very well at all. Uh, but how can we push conversation further to talk about the little pieces that everyone else is not talking about? And that tends to be my role all the time anyway. Like what, what is not being spoken about in this circle? Um, and, and is it just about tech? Is it just about uh, race of the top? Or can I talk about uh, what's happening within our education sphere um, along racial lines, around, along teacher leadership lines? What are things that are actually happening? So, And in all honesty, whatever's going to be, um, whatever's going to move uh, the needle, it's not going to come out of the Department of Education, right? Um, it's not going to happen there. And it's not because uh, it could not happen there. People misunderstand the role of the U.S. Department of Education. They do provide resources, but really the local level is where reforms are going to happen and take hold. If we're waiting for somebody to come down from um, Mount Capitol Hill to save our children, the children will not be saved. And we're going to be having this conversation a generation and another generation behind. So, you know, I think people put too much credence on demanding that Arnie Duncan be something or something else um, and deflect from the conversation about what we're doing in our own communities locally to support the growth and development of young people and build bridges with one another. So, um, Tony, you have the last question.
So conversations need to go beyond Twitter so that people um, aren't misunderstood and misrepresented. But what I will also submit is that um, I've pushed on people who use that as an excuse. They have said, every time I try to talk about race, people push back on me and challenge what I'm saying. Okay, I'm sorry it's not comfortable. I'm sorry it's not comfortable for you, but being a black woman in America is not comfortable for me a lot of times as well. So if we're waiting for conversation to be polite about race, we are waiting too long. Um, and it has to go beyond, it has to, it's definitely, it has to go beyond social media, but social media does allow us to um, have a forum and a space to springboard and start the conversation. Somebody said um, on Twitter, uh, we don't need to wait for permission to get going, so. Also, what platforms are we actually developing in order to have those conversations anyway? This is always going to be uncomfy. It's always going to hurt a little bit. And I'm, I'm sorry for your feelings, but we need to address this in a Absolutely. very big way. And if you kind of mess up a little bit, then we need to have that conversation. But we can have it constructively where we build on something, but people can't. We, we have to knock out the fear just a little bit because it's there is no substitute for the lived experiences of many of us who live through racism. Right. And those those trans transgressions are ways that we can build closer bonds, sure. right? If we are only being polite with one another, we don't really see what other people are made of and where they're coming from. So if we spend so much time not stepping on one another's toes, we really don't know what's going to happen when it's time to go to war with that person. I don't want you having my back in this war because, you know, we've only been polite with one another. And I don't know if you're going to drop your gun and run when it's time to go in there and save this kid, right? Um, but if I know that I called you out on being racist and you push me back and say, you don't know me, then I'm like, okay, we have a place to start. Let's let's keep moving together. So um, absolutely. And it's on us to create those spaces beyond the Twitter sphere and other forms of social media. So I wanna thank my brother, Jose Vilsim. Let's give him a round of applause. Shout out to those people who are watching live via Google Hangout on the mid-career website. Uh, shout out to the folk using the uh, hashtag Pen Ed Chat Back channel. Um, please do follow Pen Ed Chat. Please do follow uh, the mid-career doctorate in ed leadership. Um, it is a transformative cohort model program for those of us who have been um, career educators and are looking to enhance our skill set. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to connect with good people and to have dialogue that is thoughtful and uh, we look forward to the next Educators on the Square in December. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.